Hello, my name's Estelle Baker and I'm the Education Officer for the Isle of Wight Heritage Service. This video is going to look at Anglo-Saxon artefacts that have been found on the Isle of Wight and what they can tell us about the status and beliefs of the person that they were buried with. I also hope that by looking at these artefacts you'll feel inspired to design some of your own jewellery. So who were the Anglo-Saxons? In 410 AD, the Emperor Honorius told the British people they would have to defend themselves. Rome was under attack and the army had to leave to protect it. Britain was under attack as well from many groups including the Irish, the Scots and the Picts. Some British leaders paid Anglo-Saxon warriors to protect them, but once settled they began to take over. These invaders invited relatives to join them and by 500 AD they had taken over most of an area east of the line from the Humber right the way down to the Isle of Wight. The Anglo-Saxons were a mixture of tribes from Denmark, Germany and the Netherlands. They settled in what was Angerland or England. The largest tribes were the Angles, Saxons and Jutes. The Jutes came from northern Denmark by 456 AD they had settled Kent. They are also thought to have settled in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. The Angles came from southern Denmark. The Saxons came from North Germany and the Netherlands. The Anglo-Saxon period spans from 410 AD to 1066 AD. By the end of the Roman period, many people in Britain were Christians. When the Anglo-Saxons settled in Britain, they brought their own religion with them. We don't know exactly what they believed as they passed on their beliefs and myths by word of mouth. However, we think they believed in many gods and supernatural forces. We also think they buried things with the deceased so that they could be used in the afterlife. This is why burials from the 5th to 7th century are particularly interesting for archaeologists. There have been few excavations during recent times and much of the evidence we have for life during Anglo-Saxon times on the island comes from artefacts found in Anglo-Saxon cemeteries during the 19th century. Here we have a model of a burial excavated in 1855 at Chessel Down. The artefacts from the burials, about 130 in total, are now with the British Museum. More recent insights into Anglo-Saxon times on the island have come from artefacts found by the general public. The Portable Antiquities Scheme is run by the British Museum and encourages the recording of archaeological objects found by the public. Finds recorded with the scheme have helped advance the knowledge of archaeology on the island. Many of the finds in this video have been very kindly donated by finders and landowners and we would like to thank these people in helping us look after the incredible archaeology of the Isle of Wight. This is actually one of my favourite artefacts. It's not from Anglo-Saxon times, it's a Roman brooch and it was found in an Anglo-Saxon cemetery near Carisbrook. Mysteriously it was found with a headless skeleton that had been buried around 300 years after the brooch was made and was still in incredible condition. It's a zoomorphic brooch, which means it represents an animal, and in this case, it's a running hare. It's made from bronze with green, blue, and red enamel. Was it a precious family heirloom that had been handed down through the generations? Was it accidentally dropped in Roman times and then found 300 years later and treasured and then buried with someone? We shall never know. These 6th century tweezers are made from bronze and were found at Chesseldown Cemetery. The artefacts found in the cemetery are similar to those found in Kent and Jutland in northern Denmark and there seems to be a close link between the two communities and the island and due to these close links sometimes we describe these cemeteries as Jutish cemeteries and there are a number of them on the Isle of Wight. The design of these tweezers is very similar to those in Roman times and even a hundred or so years after the end of Roman rule in Britain, people continue to care for their appearance 
and would remove unwanted hair with tweezers like these. Over this period, there was a change in what people were using, possibly their language and beliefs and what they had. And we're not sure if this was because there was an Anglo-Saxon elite that had come from places like Jutland, brought their ideas with them and took control, or if they were local chieftains or traders, farmers that were taking on these ideas and fashions. In all likelihood, it was probably a mixture of both of these. Even the design of everyday objects like bowls changed from the Roman times through to Anglo-Saxon times. And this bowl has got dimples punched around the rim of it. And bronze bowls like this belong to a class of bead rim bowls found on the continent, especially in the Rhine and the Meuse Valley. The Meuse River runs from France through Belgium, the Netherlands and ends in the North Sea. And bowls like this are often associated with the graves of rich women. Sometimes they're found with men and children as well. This one was found on top of a skeleton in a Jutish cemetery on the Isle of Wight, and it dates from around the 5th and the 6th century. This beautiful glass armlet is decorated with a continuous frieze of alternating triangles with concave oval centres. It's incredible that this has survived for around 1,500 years and probably originated in the Meuse Valley, like the bowl that we saw just before. It was found on the edge of a chalk pit at Chesseldown Cemetery in 1909 and it was on the arm of a skeleton just between the shoulder and the elbow. Many of the finds from this site are held by the British Museum, but some are on display in the Museum of Ireland History. This is a blue glass melon bead and it was found at Chesseldown Cemetery and was made in the 6th century. Beads were worn on strings, usually between a pair of brooches. Beads were mainly worn by Anglo-Saxon women and young girls. Men may have used one or two beads, either as a necklace, as belt toggles or as a sword fastening. The amber that these beads are made out of was probably imported from the Baltic. These 6th century beads may have been chosen for their vivid colour, but amber was also believed to give protection from diseases. As well as beads, coins, teeth and metal rings were often suspended on Anglo-Saxon necklaces. These decorated glass beads also came from a Jutish burial site. I think they look incredibly modern and it's hard to believe that they're around 1,500 years old. To create colours, Anglo-Saxon glassmakers added minerals to the glass, such as copper for red, tin for yellow, and some beads were shaped by rolling them on a smooth marble block whilst the glass was still soft. This incomplete Anglo-Saxon silver gilt disc brooch was found in Shorewell in 2010 and was kindly donated to the Heritage Service by the landowner and the finder. It was made between 550 and 600 AD and is decorated with three evenly spaced garnets. Each sit on top of gold foil so that it really brings out the brightness of the garnet and it's what we would describe as zoomorphic and geometric. The space between the garnets has got these C-shaped patterns here which we believe is the head of an animal and then these lines here are the body and then it's got a head on the back of it that you can see here. The rim is cast with interlocking triangles and it's a sort of darker colour you can see there that's called niello and it's made from a, a black mixture with sulphur, copper, silver and lead and it's used as an inlay on engravings especially silver and it's added as a powder or a paste and then fired until it melts and flows or is pushed into the engraved lines of the metal so that the decoration shows up more easily. It may have been used to fasten the opening of an item of clothing. 
brooches were often plated with gold to emphasise the status of the owner. This identical pair of gilded silver disc brooches with a garnet in the centre and glass around the outside came from Shalcombe Down. The barrow collapsed around 1745 and was excavated in 1816 by John Dennett. The brooches were found along with tweezers and an iron sword. Swords that have been found in graves with items usually associated with females have later been identified as weaving swords. Women wore brooches in pairs to fasten their dresses. Brooches were also known as dalk or spenels to the Anglo-Saxons and this one is from the mid to late 6th century. A metal detectorist found this golden glass pendant in Calbourne in 2014. It looks surprisingly modern, but similar pendants have been found in the graves of women and date from the 7th century. Found by a metal detectorist in October 2018, this gold mount is decorated with filigree, which is twisted threads of gold, and is inlaid with a flat red gem, which is most probably a garnet. It dates from around 575 to 650 AD and was probably part of a bigger piece of jewellery or a dress accessory. Many of the items we've looked at so far are commonly found in female graves. The items we're going to look at next are mostly things that are found in male graves and we'll look at some of the weapons that are found in there and also some of the decorative items that might have gone on sword belts and things like that. This mid to late 6th century sword was excavated in 1816 on Shalcombe Down. Swords were very valuable in Anglo-Saxon times and would be handed down from generation to generation. Some swords were received or given as gifts by great warriors and kings. If a sword once belonged to a famous warrior, it was considered to have greater value, perhaps because it was believed to possess the previous owner's bravery. Anglo-Saxon saw blades were between 72 and 80 centimetres long and about 7.5 centimetres broad at their widest. Sword rings like this would have been attached to the pommel and the upper guard of a sword hilt and prominently displayed. These sword rings were found in Areton in 2013. They're made from silver and partly covered in gold and they have a zigzag pattern and triangles inlaid with niello, which is a black mixture and highlights the pattern. One side of each ring is decorated with evenly spaced raised S-shaped motifs set on end to end. The opposite recess side has two concentric V-section ridges separated by grooves. The function of sword rings is still uncertain. They may have been given by kings and princes to members of their retinues as a reward for military service. It could have been a way for the wearer to show loyalty to his lord and his high status or office. They date from 450 to 650 AD and similar ones have been found on the Isle of Wight, Kent and Lincolnshire. This stunning gold pyramidal mount was discovered in Benbridge in September 2002 and the purchase of it by the Isle of Wight Heritage Service was supported by the Heritage Lottery Fund. Pyramidal mounts were attached to the suspension strap of a sword scabbard where they tightened the scabbard suspension loop. They were generally made in either silver or copper alloy and over 100 examples have been found. Sword mounts are a high status object. This 7th century pyramidal mount has 16 pentagonal panels of two sizes. It's made from lightweight gold strips soldered to a single backing plate of sheet gold that lines the interior of the mount. The cells are now empty apart from one that is filled with a cut plate garnet. And that's here. Imagine how it would have looked when it was completely filled with them. The top contains a single cell which is now empty but might possibly have also held a garnet. 
The base has two semicircular openings through which a leather strap would have been threaded. Here we have another 7th century pyramidal mount. This one is hollow with a square cell lined with gold at the apex here. Similar mounts are often set with a small garnet in the top and as you might have guessed by now, the Anglo-Saxons were very fond of garnets. This gold strap or belt mount was found in the parish of Calborn and dates from the late 6th, early 7th century. It was made from a short length of beaded gold wire wound six times to form a cone whose apex is filled with an individual gold bead. It is a unique design. The mount is hollow and bridged by a narrow gold strip under which a strap could have been threaded. This gold mount was found in Bryston in 2018. It's made from sheet gold and gold wire. It has a hole in the top, which may mean it was attached to another object. It's very typical of decorative bosses that were attached to deluxe jewellery, dress accessories and weapon fittings in the 7th century. Sword fittings and buckles found at Sutton Hoo and within the Staffordshire Horde have been very similar to this mount. Here we have an iron barbed arrowhead from a 6th century grave. Anglo-Saxons would have been skilled in the use of the bow. Archery would have been a part of a battlefield, but by practising every day, the skill would mostly have been used for hunting. Wood does not survive well in the soil, and so far no remains of bows and arrow shafts from the period have been found. Our only evidence are iron arrowheads like this one here. The spear was the main weapon of the Anglo-Saxon period. Peasants, soldiers, even the nobility would use a spear. It was the traditional weapon of Woden, one of the principal gods. Slaves were not allowed to carry a spear. Any slave found with one would have the wooden shaft broken over their back in punishment. A man with no fighting experience could quickly be trained to use a spear. Drawings from the period often show warriors holding several spears in one hand and a single spear in the other. Most of these were thrown at the enemy and the last spear would be used for hand-to-hand -hand fighting. This spear was found in a 6th century Jutish burial on the island. Shields were used by warriors as a movable piece of armour to protect them from enemy swords, spears and arrows. Shields had a central iron boss on the front, like this 6th century one made of iron. This would protect the warrior's hand. Wooden or metal bands were fixed to the back of the shield to reinforce them. Some shields were edged with a rim of sewn thick leather or hide to strengthen them. Most shields were made out of lime wood, which was naturally good at absorbing blows. Below the shield boss, we've got an image of some handles. These would have been on the back of the shield. In 2004, the Isle of Wight Metal Detecting Club reported finding fragments of Anglo-Saxon grave goods near Shorewell. The objects had been scattered by ploughing. One grave was identified and excavated by the Isle of Wight Heritage Service. The remains suggested a high-status male warrior had been buried there between 500 and 550 AD. Helmets are so rare that only kings and their chief nobles were likely to own them. This is one of only six Anglo-Saxon helmets that has ever been found in England and the sole example of the Frankish style which adds to its significance. The others were crested helmets like the one found at Sutton Hoo. It is made from eight pieces of iron riveted together with copper alloy rivets. And in the picture here, you can see the fragments that were found and then they were reconstructed by the conservators at the British Museum. And finally, we had a local blacksmith 
recreate the helmet here on the Isle of Wight. A metal bowl with a handle is called a skillet. This copper alloy skillet is in extremely good condition and dates from the late 7th to 9th century. It was found in Shell Fleet by a local metal detectorist in 2005. The exciting find was reported to the island's finds liaison officer for the Portable Antiquities Scheme and was taken to the conservator of the Isle of Wight Heritage Service for treatment. The skillet was then cleaned and treated to prevent deterioration. The skillet has a cross riveted onto its handle. This Christian symbol indicates it was probably used in a baptism ceremony. The skillet is a nationally rare find from the Anglo-Saxon period. This was a time when Christianity was being introduced to England and some communities were resistant to the new religion. Our skillet is particularly important to the story of the island's conversion to Christianity. The Isle of Wight was supposed to have been one of the last places in England into which Christianity was introduced. This silver coin brooch takes us towards the end of the Anglo-Saxon times on the Isle of Wight. It's a silver penny of Athelred II and he reigned from 978 to 1016 AD and it was made into a brooch at a later date. It was minted in York. The coin is actually made of silver and then has been gilded on both sides. The brooch would have been worn so that the cross would be visible. Many coin brooches from the late Anglo-Saxon and early Norman periods have been found. The brooch was found near Chilliton in 2017. Single coins are not usually classed as treasure, but because the coin had been converted to a brooch, it was declared to be treasure by the coroner. The Treasure Act ensures that important archaeological finds are reported and where possible, save for the future within local museums. I've really enjoyed showing you these artefacts from our collections and I hope that they've inspired you to think about doing some of your own jewellery designs.